Hello and welcome. My name is Raj Basord. I'm a consultant psychiatrist based in central London. And I'm in conversation today with Jennifer Strickland and Julie Walker, who are two bibliotherapists. And the reason we're having this conversation today and talking about bibliotherapy and finding out what bibliotherapy is and whether it works or not is that there's an exciting new conference coming up in October on bibliothe bibliotherapy and we'll talk, be talking a bit about that. But let me start by asking you both uh, Julie and Jennifer, what is bibliotherapy? Well we do have an official definition which is bibliotherapy is the use of fiction and poetry to support and increase positive outcomes for people with mental health and well-being issues. But that's a bit of a mouthful and it still doesn't really explain it. What explains it better is if I just read an extract from Jeanette Winterson's memoir, Why Be Happy When You Could Be Normal. Um, so I'll just read a short quote from this that gives you an, um, an idea of what bibliotherapy is. I was 16 and my mother was about to throw me out of the house forever for breaking a very big rule even bigger than the forbidden books. The rule was not just no sex, but definitely no sex with your own sex. I was scared and unhappy. I remember going down to the library to collect the murder mysteries. One of the books my mother ordered was called Murder in the Cathedral by T.S. Eliot. She assumed it was a gory story about nasty monks and she liked anything that was bad for the Pope. The book looked a bit short to me. Mysteries are usually quite long. So I had a look and saw it was written in verse. Definitely not right. I wasn't read my poetry because aim was to work my way through English literature in prose, but this was different. I read, this is one moment, but know that another shall pierce you with a sudden painful joy. The unfamiliar, beautiful play made things bearable that day, and the things it made bearable were another failed family. I was confused about sex and sexuality and upset about the straightforward practical problems of where to live, what to eat and how to do my A-levels. I had no one to help me but the T.S. Eliot helped me. So when people say that poetry is a luxury or an option for the educated middle classes or that it shouldn't be read at school because it's irrelevant or any of the strange and stupid things that are said about poetry and its place in our lives, I suspect that the people doing the same have had things pretty easy. A tough life needs a tough language, and that's what poetry is. That is what literature offers, a language powerful enough to say how it is. It isn't a hiding place, it's a finding place. And we find that that's quite true. Um, we actually work in um, various settings. So we work in acute clinical settings, um, acute admission wards, um, rehabilitation units in the community, in community settings with charities such as Community Links, um, Alzheimer's Society and in the library. Um, when we're working in clinical settings though, we always have a staff member, a dedicated staff member with us um, who can give us information about anyone in the group that we might need to know beforehand. Um, for instance, when I was on Ward 18 in Jewsbury Hospital recently, um, one mem uh, the member of staff that works with me um, mentioned that it wouldn't be good to mention any kind of technology because I had someone who was quite paranoid at the time and felt that he was being controlled by um, television and radio and so on. We wouldn't say that, it's, uh, that it has the word therapy in it, but it isn't a therapy like counselling. It's a bit of a stupid sort of American word that we're stuck with. Um, but it, and it isn't a replacement for counselling, but it's like an added alternative that we found gives access to the person underneath the illness and also helps them to express themselves better. Um, it's not about bringing literature to people but about using the literature as a tool to help the people. Um, we think it's better to um, explain and give you some examples rather than explain. So for instance, um, I did a session at um, Batley Alzheimer's Society and a lot of older people have had to learn poems off by heart when they were young and of course in dementia the long term memories is what sort of goes last and there was one lady there who never joined in and she joined in this time, in fact I only had to give her the first two lines and she was off joining in and she really engaged with that session and was laughing and talking afterwards as well and her husband came up to me at the end of the session and said thank you for that because it's just reminded me of who she is 
why I love her and why I'm putting up with all this stuff because for a short while there she was her old self again. Um, so that's one one example. Another one is, um, you know, on Ward 18 there was a very agitated lady sort of walking up and down, wringing her hands, extremely agitated, just repeating the same phrase over and over again. And um, so we did some rhythm poems. And after a while she came and sat at the table. And after a while she stopped repeating um, the things that she was repeating. Um, so it does um, sort of work in, in that way. Um, Judith Hooper, our Director of um, Public Health, is very enthusiastic about what we do um, and there is actually um, a video, a short 10 minute DVD that people can access to see what we do. It's on HTPP, um, call on two forward slashes, vimeo.com forward slash well into words and there's some beneficiaries on there. But I think Jennifer's got some examples to give as well. Okay, Jennifer. Um, one of the examples that I've got, when Julie and myself met up yesterday, we just found that examples were coming thick and fast, but one particularly unusual set of circumstances was a gentleman that I'd been working with who um, suffered from bipolar, and this was probably a few weeks after um, a very serious suicide attempt and we were sat talking and I asked him about what he was reading and he told me he was reading something by H.P. Lovecraft which is very dark and very sinister and I was a bit uncomfortable with the fact that he was reading something like that and I put that to him and he said no I know what you mean but when I'm reading the, the book those dark and gruesome thoughts are in that book and I'm distracted from my own dark thoughts and he said but when I close that book the dark thoughts of the story stay in that book and all of a sudden my problems are a bit easier because I've had some time out just to sort of get myself together again. So it was quite an unusual set of circumstances that that came across and if he'd have said to me, um, you know, given the circumstances, I would like to read something by Lovecraft, I would have actually said, oh, I'm not sure that that's a good idea. But it was just really interesting to see that this was something that he'd come up with himself and he was able to articulate the logic behind his decision and it certainly did benefit as well. But why does it have to be um, books or uh, literature or poetry? I mean, I get the idea that contact with, with stories and using stories as a jumping off point to have a conversation about what's going on in people's lives um, is helpful. But for example, could it not be clips of video on YouTube or, or even movies? Because some people um, don't read that much. So could it be movies, for example? Is that a form of bibliotherapy? You could use that. I mean, what I've used in the past is, um, are just short quotes, um, because as you say, people they're not readers or they find it difficult to concentrate or they feel as though they've got to be a natural born academic and a session that I ran on Wednesday was just um, a short quote and it was about birthdays and from that the client who read out the quote um, then went on to say that she had a meeting with her psychiatrist this afternoon she was um, very nervous about it and together as the group we sort of came up with ideas as to what might help her with the nerves and perhaps how realistic were her um, options as it were. So we did we did get a very long discussion, a very helpful discussion because she did say afterwards thank you I feel so much better and that was just literally off a very short quote. The, the other thing about movies though is we don't, I mean the trouble is that word literature um, because it's, it isn't about sort of the classics or anything, anything, we use anything, um, and chiclet, anything, because reading, I always think, is like, it's a bit like food, isn't it? Sometimes you want a gourmet meal, sometimes you want meat and two veg, and then another time, um, you know, a pot noodle might hit the spot, and it's the same with reading, but the thing is that you, can, you can't interact with a movie, you just watch it, you're not engaged with it, um, whereas you can engage... Why we're sort of we feel we're quite different is because we do have a lot of different tools and we use those tools. So it isn't just about reading out loud and sharing it with other people. We do things like we cut up poems, obviously not rhyming poems, 
and, and give it to people and, and, and see how they put them together and that leads to a really good discussion. We use song lyrics, um, you know, we, we sort of, we have a lot of tools at our disposal so we use book covers as well and, you know, discussions about, oh, what, which one appeals to you and so audio books as well, I mean, if people don't read or if they've got a low literacy level or if they're too ill to concentrate for long at that time, then there are books, audio books are often a good recommendation and ones perhaps like a Bill Bryson or something that they can sort of tune into and tune out of and it doesn't matter if, if they've missed some of it. Um, because, you know, we plan our sessions, I plan my sessions on Ward 18, Jan, Jen plans her sessions for Ward 19, but I arrive on the ward and within two seconds of sitting down I think, well, that's not going to work today. So you've got to be able to pull something else out of the bag. Um, so it is, it's, it's about sort of drawing people in and the discussions go off in, in sort of a, well, you don't know where they're going to go sometimes. I mean, we had a First World War discussion and we secreted to soon and, you know, we ended up wondering if Vidal Sassoon was any relation and so it, it just sets up a discussion and uh, an atmosphere where people can talk and, and sort of wind around the ways, but it also sometimes people you know can sort of identify stand in another pair of shoes through a fictional character and view the world from a different sort of point of view another thing about it is is that it's reciprocal and I think that's one of the things that's really special about this because people recommend books to me in the sessions and if they do I always make sure that I get it and I read it um, and then it's fine you know it's fine to say no nah, I didn't really enjoy that um, Ward 18, not long ago, um, there was a poem and I sort of got I got what it was saying but I knew that I hadn't really nailed that last nine and just didn't really understand what it was. Um, and this one lady was really, um, she was hearing voices and was, you know, sort of very agitated, couldn't concentrate for long and kept coming in and coming out because that's another thing, the group um, in acute settings, people can come in and out, it's done in a communal area, so it's not a closed group, so people do tend to come in and out and, and that's fine. And um, she was just walking past and she just threw out the meaning and she nailed it. And, you know, that is, I think, particularly when you're in the throes of a, of a mental illness, sometimes you can feel that you're always taking. It's nice to be able to give something back. Um, but we do have to sort of adapt what we do. Um, and it isn't just about literature and high literature. It's just about words, really. And, um, you know, learning through those words. We also do some creative writing as well. In fact, we've got one gentleman, and when he goes to see a psychiatrist, he says to him, don't tell me how you're feeling, just give me the poetry you've been writing and let me have a look. And that's it, it gives people language, instead of just saying, oh, I feel down, you know, they can say, you know, well, I feel like I've got this great big sideboard sat on top of my head. So it gives people language as well. well but for example, um, if I'm dealing with a client and there's a sense in which one of their issues is they're feeling trapped, um, by some life predicament. I might ask them if they've seen the film The Shawshank Redemption, which is a famous film, and I, 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 I would use a film like that because it's in a lot of people's top ten lists of their favorite films. And The Shawshank Redemption is a, is a prison movie about a man in prison. So I will use that as a story, uh, as a way of entering a discourse with the patient or the client about what it is like to feel trapped and what the possible solutions or responses are. So what I'm driving at is that it feels to me that you're doing that, that you're using stories or fiction or some stimulus to engage with the patient uh, or the client. And so therefore, if I use the example of the Shawshank Redemption, which is just we're having a, we would then have a conversation about the, the movie, that sounds very similar to what you're doing. It, it does. It does sound quite, quite similar. But the thing is, I think one thing is it's that the skill of the bibliotherapist is knowing um, what kind of um, piece of work to recommend um, because you know it's 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 hard to be pre it's easy to be prescriptive but for instance one person with depression might say yeah I want to read a book with a character who's got depression and um, it really helped me 
But another person might say, it's the last thing I want to read, it really didn't help me. So you can't be prescriptive about, well, if you're feeling depressed or if you're feeling trapped or whatever, this, this will help you because it will help some and it won't help others. And so it's having that huge bank of, of literature. And the thing is about films is, you know, there can be huge bits where it's not really relevant or bits where they have to concentrate more. In, in books, you can pick it up and put it down and come back to it later, and, and it's there all the time. You don't have to sort of go and find a screen and put the DVD in. I mean, I suppose the difference with using things like films is that it doesn't really get a conversation going as well as, say, a book group would. Because, for example, in a book group, you will get people who come and for a while they don't want to read anything out loud. They're just happy to sit and listen. And then as they begin to get a little bit more confident and a little bit more comfortable within the group, they'll tend to then gradually move forward. I have a lady in one of my groups and at first she just did not want to read anything out and I've managed over the weeks to just give her enough confidence to read out a short quote. Now that might not sound much to some people but that was a very big deal to her and having that confidence of just reading something very short in a group situation, in a public place perhaps, can make all the difference between somebody being in the supermarket and feeling able to ask a member of staff where something might be. Now things like that are very difficult to measure but they are relevant nevertheless and with the books and the groups that we run it's interactive with films not so much because you don't get any sort of response you, you are looking at a screen and you might be enjoying what you're watching but in some ways that's pretty much it but 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 hang on a second what what i'm saying is i would in, in the session i would have with a client i'd be discussing the story we wouldn't be watching the film together they no. would have watched the film before uh, so we're interacting about the story that's what you're doing you're interacting about a story as well i think the setting makes a big difference and i think as well because we're not clinicians and we're very clear about that. In some ways that can break down a barrier as well. And we are in a public place. So in some ways that can put somebody at ease. I think sometimes people see the doctors and they feel as though they come out and they've forgotten to mention this, that and the other. Whereas in a group, that's less likely to happen, partly because we're able to spend more time with that person and we might see them in a couple of weeks anyway. So the conversation does take place, it does take happen, but it's a very, very different setting. I'd just like to add as well that um, poetry is short, um, so you can't always tell. I mean, you would say you, you'd use a Shawshank, Shawshank Redemption for someone feeling trapped, but sometimes we just use all sorts of things and you don't know what is going to hit you know, what is going to hit a spot with people. And it's having that variety of, of material and not being prescriptive about, you know, the, the material you're using. Okay, let's take a few practical examples. Let's say, because I also think that bibliotherapy, I think, doesn't necessarily have to be done in a group setting. In other words, an individual could hear a book that you, you and I might discuss right now and recommend. Let's say they're depressed. They could go away and read that book and they could get something from that without even necessarily having to interact with a therapist. So um, let, let's say someone is listening to this and is depressed. What would you recommend that they might read, and how would you, and, and how might they read that? What 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 is it about that that might help them with their depression? That would be we we as I, as I was saying, it's an individual thing. We do have certain books that we use regularly, but we wouldn't be prescriptive. So it would, through conversation with that person, that is how we would find a way in, and possibly we might do that with some short quotes with um, some little lines of poetry, with the beginnings of some books, the first lines of some books, to find out which one is going to hit the spot with them. And another thing that we need to think of is the level of concentration and the level of wellness. Um, are they going to need something with sort of short little bits in? What are they wanting out of that book? Are they going to are they needing to find something that's going to make them laugh? Or are they going to need to find something that's going to um, make them think? 
So do you see what I'm saying? We, we can't be prescriptive, but yes, it can be done with an individual. Um, but it is that immediacy of sort of reading something together and saying, oh, what did you think about that? And did she think she was right to do that? And well, I don't know what that means. And that's sort of the beauty of it, really. All right, but what about um, something that you may have read um, when you've been a bit low that you found very helpful? I mean, let's uh, put it like that then, just to take an example. Or either of the two of you, something that you've read that had an emotional impact upon you that you found helpful. Um, well, some actually some quotes. We, d we have developed another system. We do texting. Uh, we've done a text in, we're doing a texting project um, that has had some really good responses. People don't have to respond to us. And some of those quotes, I mean, there is one that's by Camus, and that's, in the depth of winter, I discovered in, that there was in me an invincible summer. And that's, that's really good. Um, for example, if people are suffering from bipolar, um, one short poem that's really useful to use is called First Fig by Edna St. Vincent Millay and that's you know my candle burns at both ends it will not last the night but oh my foes and ah my friends it gives a lovely light and that just leads into a discussion about you know the seductions of if you're going into sort of a high phase um, so we'd use that Toast by Nigel Slater is something that we usually use. I'll put you on to Jen and, and she can give some re recommendations as well. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, I mean, when I, when I personally read, I tend to, my own preference is to read as a form of escape. But say, for example, um, you were referring to a client that may be feeling trapped and what might help. Something like um, The Diary of Anne Frank is a story of imprisonment, it's a story of, of loss, if you like, and it can be read in short bursts. People don't feel as though they've got to sit down and read a whole chapter. They might just read about what happened on the 27th of April 1944. But similarly, I might have a client who wants to read um, about something that's relevant to anxiety and depression, but not full of doom and gloom. And off the top of my head, I would probably suggest something like um, Beyond the Great Indoors, which is by Ingvar and Björnson. And it tells the story of two men who have recently been discharged from a rehabilitation unit. And one man has um, problems with anxiety and depression. And he struggles to use the telephone and he has a lot of intensive support. But what makes it all the more farcical is that his friend is actually actually a Neanderthal. So you have the, the very real and very pertinent problems going on, but the fact that the uh, second character is just a complete fantasy, it sort of lightens the mood a little bit. So it's, it's a very warm story, but it also gets the point across very well that um, anxiety and depression can make you feel trapped. And in, in this, this story, he does feel very trapped, but as time goes on, he begins to get enough confidence with the support that he gets. But it is quite slapstick, it is quite comical as well. So that's quite a light read. Um, it does focus on the problems, but it doesn't bring you down too much, which some people might find that a little bit difficult. That's a very good example. Tell us a bit more about this conference that's coming up. Can anyone attend and and what's going to be happening at the conference? The conference came about because we'd been getting an increasing number of inquiries about the type of work we do um, and particularly from abroad and even though we do offer training we thought an international conference would be um, a really great thing to do and it's aimed at health, social care staff, as well as staff from library services, and anybody with a general interest in bibliotherapy and how it might work. The conference is Wednesday the 29th of October at Huddersfield Town Hall, and it's examining what bibliotherapy is, how it can apply to health and well-being, and then there's also going to be some practical workshops as well, and a short play which will be performed by service users from a local mental health service, um, and they've been learning the play through um, reading and developing a short script. 
And if people are interested and they would like more information, then go to the website kirklees.gov.uk forward slash events. It sounds like bibliotherapy is an excellent way of using public libraries. Public libraries are under threat um, and um, people may be less bothered in terms of taboo and stigma about going to a library compared to going to a clinic. So um, is there a move to try and have bibliotherapy in, in every public library, a bibliotherapy group, let's say? Um, what are your thoughts about that? Well, we have book check groups in um, quite a few of our libraries um, and um, for the conference we're actually getting quite a few people from very different library authorities from right from Scotland down to the coast of Kent down to Brighton so um, I think it is something that is growing for libraries and libraries are a perfect place because libraries are often seen as a safe place for people to come um, and the beauty of the library is it can um, it's integrative, so not everyone in our book chat groups has a mental health issue um, or a well-being issue. So the beauty of it is that it helps people to integrate. It's not sort of a, a group for people with mental health issues. The other beauty of libraries is that we can signpost people on. Um, we have information there, so we can signpost people on to, you know, help with the benefits, if they need a blue badge, we can deal with all those kind of things as well. So libraries are sort of a perfect place for people to come. They act as a bridge really from a clinical setting, so when we visit people on a ward or in a rehab unit, we become a familiar face and then we run the book chat groups in the libraries, so we're a familiar face and they know what a book chat group is and they can come to the group, so we're actually hoping that what we do um, can help to put a little bit of a wedge in that revolving door of, of admissions and so on. So yeah, I think libraries are very important and also because they've just got such a wealth of stock um, that we can use, um, you know, that, that you couldn't get anywhere else. Um, so libraries are perfect. But it also sounds as though there should be bibliotherapy, in my view, on every psychiatric ward. And what, what's happening in, in, in terms of whether that's going to be happening or not? Uh, obviously, it's happening in your area in that the wards that you visit have bibliotherapy, but I, I suspect it's still very rare. Yes. Yes, you're right there, but that's, that's our dream. This is what we would like to see. This is why we're having the conference, because we do do training um, in bibliotherapy. It is certainly a, a crest of a wave. It's a wave that's, that's becoming more and more interest in bibliotherapy. Um, and our concern, we've been doing it for 14 years now, and there are different sort of uh, methods of doing it. And, and, you know, that's okay, but we sort of feel that you need a lot of tools. You can't just always get together and, and, and read some poems or so, and that wouldn't work. Um, so we like to offer training. There's two levels. There's what we call bibliotherapy light, which you could do sort of in care homes and in book chats in libraries. And then there's the more intense sort of bibliotherapy, which is what, what is sort of happening on wards and so on. So we offer this training to anyone in you know any setting. Um, our dream would be that we would get the training accredited um, so that there would be a level of competence that we could be sure of. Um, because, you know, not everybody might be might be equipped to sort of deal with um, some of the problems that can, can happen in groups. Um, so we need, you know, we need to have people who can deal with that. So we like to offer the training and also spread the word about bibliotherapy and, if possible as well, have a virtual community of bibliotherapists because Jen and I find that, you know, sometimes you just need someone else to sort of talk to and say, oh, that session didn't go well, or, oh, I'm a bit stuck with this, and to, you know, sort of swap resources with, because if we always do the same thing in our sessions and use the same material, we're going to get bored, and that's going to come across. So we need to keep ourselves sort of invigorated and try different things and do different things and find new material. Um, so, so there would be a benefit of having that virtual community there, and it certainly does help in the clinicians as well because it gives them access to the person. I think the future of bibliotherapy as well is that, um, I mean I have um, used bibliotherapy on stroke wards, 
on neuro people with neurological illness wards and also on um, people with spinal injuries wards because there is this thing um, I've heard the term comorbidity which is an awful term but people for instance Joe one of our other bibliotherapists who's retired now had a lady who had diabetes and her her leg and her foot were breaking down but because she was depressed she didn't look after herself so the diabetes her leg and her foot became worse and because they became worse she got more and more depressed and it was this sort of cycle of just you know nothing ever happening and bibliotherapy can help to sort of break that cycle really. Um, so yes, that there's another thing is the texting project that we do, which I don't believe anybody else does. Sort of we there is a way forward with using new technology. So it's constantly developing. Because the program that we've got is we've got 146 characters and we never do it at the same time. So people they'll get a quote once a week on the phone by text. It costs them nothing and they don't have to respond. Um, but um, we send it out at different times, different days, so they never know when they're going to get it. And it's just a short quote of, of, of poetry or a couple of lines or a quote from a book. And people have said that that really, really helps them. Um, you know, they've found it useful. People can respond if they want to. And um, I actually have got a, a response um, from um, a young man. Um, who um, from the texting project and I'll just read out what he what he texted back it was just hi I just wanted to say thank you for the bibliotext they really helped me get through my battle with anorexia from which I'm fully recovered now the quotes that particularly helped me were the one about life being like a washing machine and coming out brighter and the quote from a Rand about not letting the spark go out that one really helped me through tough times and now I can also see that it's true. Thanks for this wonderful service. I'm just going to pass it to Jen to see if she's got something to add. Um, I mean, I've also got um, examples from quotes that I've used that on the sound, on the surface might sound quite profound. Um, but one of the texts that I used, one of the quotes, um, isn't it nice to think that tomorrow is a day without any mistakes in it yet? And for somebody who's re receiving the text, they might think, yes, that's quite profound, and they might see the gist of it. But if you were to tell them that it's a quote from Anne of Green Gables beforehand, they might think, well, that's a bit a bit <laughs> um, immature as it were, what, why would you send me Anne of Green Gables, I don't even know what that is. But just taking out little snippets and texting them onto people and they don't have to reply if they don't want to. Um, in previous posts I found that there were a lot of service users who would buy a mobile phone but they didn't have anybody to contact they just literally had mobile phones and I think some were so fixated on getting a mobile phone that when they did actually buy it the only people that, whose numbers they could start may have been perhaps a next of kin or a doctor but nothing social so they can receive text messages such as these and they can receive them at any time of day as Julie says we make a point of not sending them out every Thursday morning for, an ex for example but if they want to reply, they can do, but if they don't want to, and cost is something that everybody has to consider nowadays, they don't have to do that either. So it can just be a little bit of company um, for that person, and they don't necessarily have to pick it up, but it will still give them something to think about and perhaps talk about when they are around people. So how could people access that texting service? How would they, is there a website they could go to or another resource so they could access it? They could contact either myself or Julie um, via email. Um, my email address jennifer.strickland at kirklees.gov.uk. Julie's email address is julieiwalker at kirklees dot gov dot uk and we can put them onto our mailing list and we will send them a text message once a week if that's what they would like and there's no obligation on them there's no obligation on them to reply as long as they give us their phone number we can add them to the mailing list okay we're running out of time a little bit and I'm gonna put something to you that's gonna make me very unpopular with both of you I think but um, my sense of talking to you is that you're both outstanding therapists and um, I would love to be able to um, 
uh, refer um, patients of mine or clients of mine to you. But there's a problem with all therapies, which is that, for example, if you take cognitive behavioral therapy, which is seen as a sort of flavor of the month at the moment, and everyone's been recommended it, is that, um, to be brutally frank, there's some very good cognitive behavioral therapists, but there are some who aren't very good. And it's not the CBT that matters so much, but it's the quality of the therapist. So I think that anyone coming to see either of you or experience bibliotherapy through either of you would definitely benefit because you're both clearly outstanding therapists. But the trouble is that bibliotherapy would work brilliantly in your hands, but it wouldn't work so well, in my view, in the hands of people who are less good than you. So there's an issue about how do we make sure there's a very high standard of training and expertise in the field, in any psychotherapeutic field, because there's some practitioners that are brilliant, like the two of you, but there are quite a large number of practitioners who, frankly speaking, are a tad indifferent. And whatever therapy they're offering, it's not going to help people because of the, the fact that they're not just not very good. I don't know if that's too inflammatory a comment. I don't know what your thoughts are. I think you're right, actually. It's something that we've both been concerned about because sometimes we have people who come and say, oh, oh, I think I could do that. I've, I've got a literature degree or whatever. And you think, well, actually, no, I don't think you can. I think there is that personality and professionalism aspect to it. I mean, we don't class ourselves as therapists. It's just an alternative sort of intervention. Um, but, yes, you're right, and that is why we would like to um, sort of, as I say, our training, there are two levels. If if you're wanting to go into care homes, for instance, and deliver sessions in there, um, that will just en help engage people and sort of pass the time and, you know, get them interested in reading and, and get them, getting them sort of talking to each other, then that's what we sort of call bibliotherapy light. And we have training for that. If you were wanting to go onto sort of acute admission wards and rehabilitation units and so on, then there is a different level of training. Um, the bibliotherapy light training that we offer takes one day. The, the other training would take longer. And also um, another concern of ours, because there, there is other training out there. And, you know, we do have the concern that, well, if you can pay for the training, then then they get trained and then off, off they go. And, that isn't right really. Um, we would like to see, this is why we would like accredited training um, and we would like to see that people are then um, sort of monitored as well um, and you know that they have um, sort of a mentor for a while. Um, so that's what our aim is. I think what also sets um, me and Julie apart from perhaps other organisations is that we actually came from a clinical background first whereas some people they may have gone to university and they've got a very good degree in English perhaps and then they've got interested into bibliotherapy that way um, whereas we've done it the other way around so say for example I've got 20 years experience working in mental health and I've worked in all sorts of settings acute forensics um, day services so I am used to running groups as is Julie but I think you get um, people in all walks of life in all professions where you scratch your head and you think how on earth did they manage to get into that job? We, we did the, the, the original bibliotherapists so weren't didn't have a, a clinical background although one of them had been a social work beforehand um, but um, all the bibliotherapists that, that well there's only been five of us but all the bibliotherapists that we we have have had experience of um, serious mental health issues in the family or so on so you know there has been if it hasn't been an actual clinical training, it is that they have experience of dealing with um, sort of difficult um, situations and, and acute illnesses. So um, sorry to interrupt you, but we are we are running out of time. Is there anything else that's very important to say before we think about closing? Um, I, I, I don't think so. I think that just, um, you know, if anybody wants to get in touch with us, um, please feel free that they can do. Um, I think that one other thing that we did want to point out in light of um, Robin Williams and what's happened um, this week with Robin Williams um, 
killing himself is that um, I was listening to um, the Today program on Radio 4 and there were some parents of a young man who'd killed himself that week and they were saying that it took so long for him to get referred and bibliotherapy I think that's one of the advantages is that we don't have a referral if a care a social worker a care worker anybody can just refer someone to us just say can you see them we'll arrange we'll meet them in the library have a chat with them and they can come to a group and it's immediate and I think in these days you know for people to feel that something's being done some to Jen I mean really it's just to sort of back up what um, Julie said there are demands on services there's no doubt about that um, particularly public sector services and as Julie says um, coming to groups in libraries there's no waiting list there's no assessment there's no holding period or anything like that people can just come and join the groups straight away and psychiatrists much as they may be willing they don't get the chance to spend the amount of time with their clients as they would like to and sometimes they could go weeks without seeing the client and not really knowing what's going on but if that psychiatrist, psychologist, nurse, whoever knows that their client is engaging in an activity that they enjoy and that they benefit from then surely that can only be a good thing okay uh, Judy Walker and Jennifer Strickland thank you very much indeed Thank you. Thank you.